welcome to the Data Democracy. Presented by renowned O'Reilly author Ole Olsen Banyu. And powered by Xenia. Make your data accessible and discoverable by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Hello everybody. You're listening to the Data Democracy Podcast. And I'm your host, Ole Olesen Benger, Chief Evangelist in Zenea and author of the book, The Enterprise Data Catalog, published by O'Reilly. In this podcast, we explore what a data democracy is. And today's guest is Anna Skulikari. Anna is the author of Learning JIT. I wanted to know what JIT is all about. And so I had a look at her book. And once I browsed it and read it, I found out it had a really interesting structure. And I wanted to ask Anna about that structure. And of course, also a lot of questions around uh, Git. Uh, so what works and what doesn't work and so on. And that's my conversation. I'll dive into that in just a second. But prior to that, here are some takeaways from my uh, conversation with Anna. First of all, as a data leader, you should learn how to use Git. Take baby steps uh, and then it will come. Also, you should focus on the basics first. That's really important. If not, you will get lost later on. And then finally, you should empower each and every one to learn Git by proving uh, yourself as a friendly and uh, kind teacher, educator, and promoter of Git. And the data democracy takeaways, there is a simple and very cool way to learn Git, and that is Anna's book. So check it out. Also, Git can be a way of connecting with more people in uh, your company, your organization that has a very high skill set. So have a look at it. And then finally, an outcome or the takeaway from this conversation that really has nothing to do with Git, but a lot to do with data democratization that Anna and I talked about is let's drop this distinction of people that are technical and non-technical. It's a total illusion. We are all both technical and non-technical people. And Anna is a very, very good showcase of that, as you will hear in just a second. Okay, so here we go. This is my conversation with Anna Skulikari. Hi, Anna. Hi, Ole. Okay, so Anna, for the listeners, will you tell a little bit about uh, your work experience, uh, your educational background, what, you, what you've done in your work life? Yeah, so my tech journey has been quite varied. I entered the world of tech uh, by studying user experience design, UX design, um, and I learned how to design apps and websites, um, which I found really fascinating. But once I'd learned how to design these things, I got really curious about how these things are actually built. So um, at the time when I was working as a UX designer, I would lived in London. When I moved here to Barcelona, which is where I'm currently based, I decided to do a coding boot camp and to learn the basics of web development. So I um, did that and then I got a job as a front end developer. Um, and then while working as a front end developer, that's when I actually had to use Git more extensively. And that's when I realized that actually the way that t Git is taught is, um, is very complicated. And I realized that I could teach it in a much, much simpler way. At the time, I was terrified of Git, and every time I had to do something that I thought was complicated with Git, I would reach out to the senior developers so that they could help me. Um, but then once I decided to conquer my fear and learn Git, um, I realized, yes, I can teach this in, in a much simpler way. Um, and then I decided to make an online course to teach Git. Um, and that kind of started my journey into tech communication and tech education. Um, so I knew while making the online course that I wanted to write a book as well. But um, I thought that the barrier to entry to uh, write a book was higher than that of a course. So I made the online course first. And um, well, a couple of years later, I wrote a book and hence uh, why I'm here. And now I work as a technical writer. So I've actually fully transitioned into tech communication. Uh, my full-time position is as a technical writer. And then I also do all my Git education work, teaching the basics, basics of Git in the most user-friendly way possible um, to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, so interesting. And I look uh, very much forward to, to dive into the topic of your book and discuss that more. But 
for the listeners, uh, you mentioned a couple of cities there. So, so uh, did you grow up in London, or how? How? Yeah. So um, I've bounced around a bit. Um, as listeners may hear, I've sort of an American accent, but actually, I'm originally Greek, uh, but I grew up in the Netherlands, and um, there I attended an international school. Hence the sort of American accent. Uh, and then when I was 18, I moved to the uh, UK and I actually went to Bristol initially. I studied at the University of Bristol and I did a bachelor's in economics. So actually, I did not work, uh, study anything like computer science or anything like that. Um, and then I moved to London after that uh, to initially study service design and then went into the field of UX design. Um, and then after living in the UK for five years, I decided it was time to move down to the south of Europe, and I moved here to Barcelona in Spain. Yeah, I'm guessing you are enjoying uh, Barcelona and the weather there more than uh, in the UK. <laughs> the weather for sure, and yeah, it's it's been a really fascinating experience. Yeah, it must have been. So let's uh, go into the topic more closely. For the, for the listeners, could you explain a little bit more? What is uh, what is Git? Yes. Um, so Git is a version control system. It's the technology that people use in order to keep track of all the versions of their code or the versions of their files. Um, and it's uh, mainly for version control and also for collaboration so that multiple people can work at, on the same project at the same time and combine their work and um, collaborate. So just to give like an idea of how it works. So let's say you're a developer and you're writing code on Monday and then you want to save a version of your code. Um, and then on Tuesday, you want to edit your code, write some more code, and you want to save another version of your code so that you know what you did on Monday, know what you changed on Tuesday. Um, and if you need to go back and see what you did on Monday, you can do that. So Git is the technology that you use to keep track of all those versions of your code. Um, And normally you use it in the command line. So you write commands in the command line and that's how you interact with Git. However, there are actually graphical user interfaces um, or Git clients that allow you to use Git from like a more visual perspective, um, but the original way is through the command line. Yeah, yeah. And I feel at home uh, using the command line, but I guess that's also generational. Um, but 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 can you elaborate a little bit about uh, why is it hard to use uh, Git? What, what makes yeah. it hard? I think the reason that it's hard to use Git is because, first of all, a lot of people find the command line scary. Um, it's not as visual as, you know... Um, other things that we use on the computer. You type commands and things happen in the background and you don't quite know what's happening. And often the output from the commands is not very user-friendly or human readable. Um, I mean, so it, it is human readable in terms of that it's usually in English, but, um, but it's not really um, simply explained. Um, so I think, first of all, the command line, that makes it scary. Uh, mm. Second of all, the language that's used in Git, um, a lot of the terms just don't naturally mean something to people. And it, you really need to spend some time to understand what the various terms and the language that's used. And the person that invented Git is Linus Torvalds. And he's a very, very intelligent person. Um, but I think when he was creating Git, um, it was more about creating this technology that would have all the features that he wanted in it, but not so much about creating the most user-friendly tool possible. So it wasn't it wasn't the user experience design approach of designing something for the user. It was kind of a technology first approach of designing something that would have all the tech features that you want, but not so much thinking about how people are actually going to use it. So um, I just don't think it was designed to be user friendly and hence why it's not user friendly. Um, but it is very powerful and an incredible tool. So yeah, definitely worth learning if you need to use it. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, can can totally uh, understand that. You've already touched upon it a little bit, but but can you tell me uh, what motivated you to write your book, Learning uh, Git? Yeah, so when I got that job as a junior front-end developer, I realized that I had to learn to work with Git. 
uh, and be confident with it in order to work smoothly with my colleagues. And um, I realized that there were no, no resources out there that taught it in a simple way that was designed for people like me, which I, I thought, you know, I'd come from this non-technical background and transitioned into tech. And I just felt like um, the learning resources out there were designed for people that had maybe studied computer science or been coding since they were 15. For example, the Pro Git book, which I refer to as the Git Bible, um, actually in the first chapter, it um, it compares Subversion and Git, and Subversion was another version control system. But it's a version control system that if someone did a coding bootcamp like me in 2018, you're never going to use it and you're never going to come across it. So obviously, those kinds of learning resources were um, written for another target audience. So um, I decided I wanted to write this book and create the online course and just create teaching material, teaching Git in a more simple way because this creative idea came to me of how I could teach it with visuals and color and storytelling. So I just knew that I could help a lot more people to learn Git in a much simpler way. And this is the book that I wish I had had on my first day as a junior front-end developer or on my first day as a coding bootcamp student um, to learn this technology in a fun and much, much more user-friendly way than other tech, other learning resources teach it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I read the book and um, and and when you open it, I mean, it's very intuitive. You just I opened the command line and I just like started typing and it worked. And that was, I mean, I've been I've been uh, messing around this with this stuff before, but it's 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 a very very intuitive very inclusive way of introducing a technology and i really like it it resonates very much with the values on this podcast like you're democratizing technology yeah and, and then uh, of course subsequently democratizing data data a little bit but also when i read the book i i was really struck by by the structure of it i really liked your structure in your book uh, can you tell me a little bit about that structure how how have you structured the book and and why have you structured in the, in the way yeah. You know. So the book is a hands-on learning experience. So it's experiential learning. Um, so from the first chapter until the last chapter, you're working on a repository where you're listing the colors of the rainbow. And every time you add a color of the rainbow to your project, um, you are making a commit. And then I have visuals, I have diagrams in the book, and every commit has the color that you most recently added to the project. Um, so that's kind of the hands-on learning experience in the book. And what I decided to do with the book is only teach the bare, bare basics to keep it as simple as possible. So you learn how to work with a local repository, you learn how to interact with a remote repository, and you learn how to combine work um, with, you know, that other people worked on or that you've worked on. So. You learn how to merge and rebase and um, do pull requests. And that's it. I, I don't go, the most complicated thing in my book is rebasing. And it's the second to last chapter. Um, so I decided that I want to focus my book on teaching a mental model of Git um, so that then once someone has this foundational mental model in place, they can then go on and learn whatever other adv more advanced or different features of Git that they want to learn. Um, but having this solid mental model in place, um, I wanted to make sure that, um, the book did not get clogged up with a lot of different features and a lot of different commands that would, um, confuse people and overwhelm them. I thought that the most generous thing to do is to give them the bare minimum and then empower them and give them the confidence to then go learn everything else that they need to learn. Also, because one thing that I should mention about Git is that it's kind of a universal um, technology for anyone that works in the world of tech because front-end developers, back-end developers, data scientists, data analysts, um, I don't know, any you name it, they've mm -hmm. used Git. So yeah. it's impossible to, um, or not impossible, but I really didn't want to include too many features of it because different people will need different features. And I wanted this yeah, book definitely. to be for everyone. Um, you know, even 
technical writers, UX designers, product managers, even those people that also sometimes need to use Git. I wanted it to just give them the bare minimum and then you can go off and explore any feature that you want to use with this tool. Yes, you mentioned in your preface that you have taken some choices of leaving stuff out. Mm -hmm. I guess those things that you left out was because you wanted a, as, as, as big a uh, audience as, as possible, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many features of Git that only certain people will want to use. Or for example, the, the features of Git that you'll have to use will depend on a lot of different factors. The company you work for, the team you work with, um, the project you're working on. So yeah, including too many features of Git uh, in this book would have just complicated things. And it's not necessary. And I'm I'm really into minimalism in all forms. And I tried to keep the book minimalist as well. Yeah. I also noticed both uh, browsing your book and reading it, the uh, appendices. Because normally I see a lot of appendices out there where authors think that, okay, this is just such a brilliant perspective. Or this idea was so good. Uh, they wanted to like not just throw those ideas out and then they put them in appendices because they can kind of like fit in there without really being necessary. I totally killed uh, some darlings myself once I when, when I wrote my book, but because I didn't want to do that exactly. But your appendices, they are a little different can, they, and I, they are very functional. Can you share some, uh, some more uh, info on yeah. why you created these uh, appendices, what they do? Definitely. One of the appendices, the first one, actually came out of user testing. And that's just one quick aside that I want to say. I user tested this book. I had three rounds of user testing. In total, around 40 people user tested this book. So this oh. book really took a design approach. I really took a design approach in creating this book, oh, actually. Cool. And one of the uh, pieces of feedback that I got in user testing was somebody that wanted to be able to start the book from any chapter. Um, and like I mentioned before, my book, you're working on a repository. So you kind of have to go from chapter one to chapter 12 in a linear way, because otherwise you can't follow the exercises. But what happens if after you've read the book, you want to just review the chapters from chapter eight onwards? Or what happens if around chapter four, you make a mistake in your repository and you don't want to have to redo chapters one through four just to be able to continue with chapter five? So I realized that I had to give um, the learners, um, the instructions to be able to start off from any chapter. So Appendix A includes instructions for how you can have the bare minimum project set up so you can start off from any chapter in the book. So that was extremely important. And the other thing about my book is that it's a visual experience. I um, create a visual representation of everything that I talk about, of every element, and throughout the entire book, you have a diagram that's showing you what's going on in your repository. Um, but that means that I have an entire visual language that I build up throughout the book. And one of the appendices is basically a place where you can go in order to get an overview of the visual language. Because it could be that you read the book and then two months later you want to jump back into it, but maybe you don't exactly remember what a black arrow means or what a gray arrow means or what the Git diagram is or what the repository diagram is. So I, that's one of the appendices is just that, um, the visual language of the book. And then finally, the last, um, it's a, I also have a quick reference with all of the commands that you cover in the book, because it's just, you know, you might want to be like, oh, what was that one command that we covered in chapter four? You don't want to be flipping through chapter four, trying to find that one command. So I just thought, <laughs> let me just have one place where people can go and, and I've organized it by chapter. You have all the commands that are introduced in the book. Yeah. It's a very nice way of like not losing because this is basically a book about actions right you can perform a lot of different actions and given uh, the like massiveness of all these actions and all their combination you can easily lose overview of that so i really like that you could have you could always consult uh, the appendices and really say okay we can we can get grounded here, and this is what is happening, and and how it is structured. So so that was really nice. In terms of 
I mean, I think that your book in itself is a dedication to data democracy and the topic of this podcast and really democratizing a technology that many people use and 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 perhaps in the future even even more people will use it. But we can discuss that at the end of the conversation. But I, I would be interested in hearing uh, like what's the most open and democratic way that you could make use of uh, Git? I think the most open and democratic way um, that you can make use of Git is just making it more accessible uh, for more people within your company. So making it easy for people to learn how to use it and empowering them to do that with confidence. Um, there's been times where I've worked with coworkers that need to do something in a repository, but they're afraid because they don't know how to use Git very well. And you can see how that completely disempowers them. And um, I definitely think we should help our coworkers out, but also we should just empower them to be like, you can learn this and I can help you learn it in a mm. user-friendly and simple way so that you feel confident and you can do the things that you want to do. And I think it's interesting talking um, about this because repositories contain information and you want to empower your uh, employees, your collaborators, people to be able to access that information and to update it. And well, if you're going to be working with Git repositories, you need to know how to use Git in order to be able to do that. So yeah, I think that's that's it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, so we also preparing for this conversation. We also talked about the language of Git itself that is sometimes not very uh, indicative or or precise. Even could yeah. you? Could you elaborate a little bit of, uh, more on that in, in regards to openness and democratic usage? I mean, what does branch really mean? What does commit yeah. really mean? Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the tricky things about Git is the language. And my best example of this is a branch, which a lot of people have the misconception that a branch in Git is kind of like a tree branch that they that branches kind of branch off one another. But if you actually go inside the .git directory and you look at what a branch really is, you find out that a branch is actually a pointer to a commit. And that's why in my book, I actually get you to go into the .git directory and I get you to open up the file that contains, um, that represents a branch. And I get you to look that, at, at that file, which just can make, contains a commit hash. And then in my diagrams, I use uh, an arrow um, to represent a branch. And that's how you really learn branches are just pointers to commits. Um, so that's one really good example of where the language that Git uses can be very confusing. Um, and and unfortunately, a lot of learning resources out there also use very confusing visualizations because a lot of learning resources and even the GitHub UI make branches look like they are tree branches. Um, yeah. And then... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what about um, commit? You also yeah, had some comments commit, about commit. Yeah. Um, well, the word commit is two things. It's a verb and a noun in the world of Git. So the noun, a commit, is a version of your project. Um, but then also the word uh, to commit uh, or the command git commit is to make a version of your project. So it's used in various different ways. Um, and as a noun, like a commit, you know, that's a completely new term that people um, don't know, will never have heard of. Um, so, um, again, another example of where terminology is a bit tricky mm. and it takes a while to get used to it. Yeah, but but I guess you have never seen, I mean, uh, we talked about this earlier, you have never seen like an undemocratic or unfair usage of, of, of Git. Uh, you mentioned this uh, earlier, right? Because I could imagine that people could like uh, pr pretend to be really tech savvy. Also, you mentioned this uh, coming from a non-technical background. Yeah, okay, I, I'm going to rant a little bit here, but I've just, I just, I really don't like that uh, expression. Uh, if if people have a technical background or how technical are you? You can also get that question. How technical? Are you? What kind of question is that? I mean, if you have studied economics. You, you mentioned you studied economics and you know complex mathematics. You know uh, what societal impact uh, different economic uh, politics can have. I mean, that is that is understanding something that is very, very complex. So I, I, I th this, this thing with categorizing people as being technical or non-technical, it's really, 
it's really this kind of engineer uh, bashing, uh, to be honest, that I yeah. don't think is very, it's not very reasonable. Um, but you have never, like, you have never seen uh, Git being used in, in, in such an, like, uh, excluding or, or undemocratic way. So, okay, so two things. The first one about it being used in an undemocratic way. I guess I just see Git as a tool. And um, I just think people can use the tool in whatever way they want. Um, I think the only undemocratic th thing you can do is is disempower your uh, people that want to use Git to not learn it and not feel confident with it and to make it seem like it's more complicated than it is or that they don't have the ability to learn to use it. I think that's the only undemocratic and disempowering thing you can do. In terms of how Git is used, um, it's a tool. You can, you know, it's a tool, a tool in your toolbox and you can use it in whatever way. Maybe the only thing I could say is if you make a very, very complicated Git workflow, which is unnecessarily complicated, but then that's just you trying to make things unnecessarily complicated and that's not necessary. Um, <laughs> and then in terms of the technical, non-technical, you're absolutely right that that is a very simplistic way of categorizing. And what I want to say on that is that actually um, Git is used by a lot of people that maybe if we used that on uh, that category, that very simplistic categorization would have been called non-technical, but that categorization doesn't really exist. So um, I designed this book to be used by people like UX designers, product managers, technical writers who are, who work in different departments in a company, for example, or um, are not developers, but they still use technical tools and um, they still need to have access to, sometimes they need to have access to repositories and to update or contribute to them. So you're right that, um, that technical non-technical is not a really great <laughs> categorization. It's, it, it's, like, it's like asking how close are you to uh, eternity? Because <laughs> technology is eternal in all dimensions. We all know of, uh, our own uh, small uh, piece of, of, uh, of technology, but no one has the entire view of, say, an IT landscape in a company or like the tech space in general that would be catastrophic to claim something like that. So we should definitely stop using that category. I use it myself. I also describe myself as a non-technical person that came into technology. and We have to stop, uh, all of us. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions left. Uh, I want to know, uh, Anna, you, you have to be the person to ask, what's your best advice for using uh, really, really fast? Okay, so my best piece of advice is get a good good, solid mental model of how the basics work. Uh, once you really know what a commit is, what a branch is, what happens when you merge, um, once you really know these things, you're able to learn any advanced feature of Git um, and to comprehend how it works. Um, but if you don't have the, that solid foundation, then you will find out later when you need to do something more complicated with Git. Um, and you will you won't have the confidence that is just m gives you the peace of mind when you're working with git so i really think that people should invest in getting that good solid foundation and then from there you know they can learn whatever they want to learn hmm. that's great advice and finally uh, how do you imagine the future usage of uh, git I think because software is kind of becoming a part of almost any industry, um, I just think that the usage of Git is just going to keep increasing. Like more and more people are going to use it. More and more people with different job titles are going to use it. Um, it's already used uh, in places other than the terminal or the command line. Um, so I think that will continue. More and more graphical user interfaces uh, will, be, will be created for people to interact with Git. I have no opinion on um, how people want to use the tool because I think it's just a tool. Use it in whatever way works for you. Um, you still need a good mental model sometimes of how it works. But then, you know, if you want to use a graphical user interface, a Git client, um, if you want to use it from an integrated, like if it's integrated in your IDE, then do what works for you. Um, but yeah, I just think that the usage of Git is going to spread out. More and more people are going to use it. and um, the world is also becoming more and more collaborative and Git is a co collaboration tool, 
at the end of the day. So that's mm, that's exactly. that's where I'm putting my money. <laughs> 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 me too me too Anna. okay thank you it's been wonderful uh, having you on uh, thank you for writing the book I think it is a very useful resource uh, that a lot of people will um, benefit greatly from thank you for taking the time to be on the Data Democracy podcast Anna. thank you for having me Ulla. <laughs>